We're going to look at Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, which features Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days, being tried and tested. And so as we prepare to do that, let's invite the Holy Spirit to inspire us, to challenge us, and to guide us as followers of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Oh God, may the words of my mouth, as well as the meditations and reflections of all our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Every single year on the first Sunday in the Lenten season, the church invites us to enter into the wilderness. Now, we all have our wilderness stories, but a personal favorite of mine goes like this. Some of you have heard it, so bear with me. My, birth, my birthday was coming up, and it was my 30th birthday, and I wanted to celebrate that milestone with a desert backpacking trip. And so I signed up for a trip, a desert 14-day trip in Moab, Utah. Now, it was a guided trip, and at the end of it, we were given the option of doing a 72-hour, a three-day solo camping experience. Now, this would have been three days and two nights. And I signed up because they had professionals there, and from a distance, they would guard you and make sure you were safe and secure. And here's a picture from that trip from long, long ago. You'll see my solo campsite with my sleeping bag there. I had a beautiful view. It was just spectacular. And I, I was having a wonderful time until the sun went down. And if you know anything about the desert, when the sun goes down, it can get pretty cold, right? And so I climbed into my sleeping bag and laid down and waited for the night to fall. And what is it about the wild beasts and those so-called inner demons that come out in the dark of the night? So as the stars came out and the, the, the skies grew darker, my, my eyes got heavy and I began to fall asleep. But I was suddenly startled. I saw something moving. And it was furry. And when it... When we were eye to eye, I have to admit to you that I flinched and I slinked down into the bottom of my sleeping bag and I screamed into it. It was a mouse. <laughs> but you know, when you're eye to eye with a furry wild beast and you're lying on the ground on your back, it is pretty startling. But I untwisted myself in my mummy bag, and I collected myself and tried to gain my composure and started breathing, trying to calm myself down. And then I must have fallen asleep again, because this time I was not only startled, I was terrified. And I knew I was terrified because my heart was pounding so hard, it felt like it was going to explode out of my, my chest. I was hearing, I kid you not, I was hearing footsteps, and they were getting closer and closer and closer, and then they went away. But then I would hear them again. Those footsteps would grow closer and closer and closer. And I was very afraid, and I didn't know what to do. So I did what I do when I'm afraid and I don't know what to do. I came up with a plan, a three-part plan. And the first plan was I was going to get up and investigate, see what was going on. The second option for me was to play possum. You, you remember playing that as a child? I, I was going to play like I was sleeping. And the third option was I was going to play dead, stone cold dead. I went with the third option, door number three, ding, ding, ding. And I tried my best to stay calm and still and not move a muscle. And then I had this eureka experience. I mean, it was, a, it, was a, it was a discovery of revelation because I realized those aren't footsteps. What was happening had to do with this. Recognize it? It's a sleeping bag. My sleeping bag 
is made out of some kind of synthetic nylon fabric. Now remember, it's cold outside, so I would have had this bag wrapped around my face. And what I discovered was the sound of footsteps wasn't footsteps at all. It was the friction of my eyelashes <laughs> sweeping against the mummy bag. And so it goes in the wilderness. But you do not have to travel to a real live wilderness or a real live desert to have that wilderness experience because desert challenges come to us all and nobody, no human being gets to escape the wilderness. At some point, we're all going to have to face something that is beyond our control, whether that be illness or failure or broken dreams or relationships. And Jesus models for us how to navigate the wilderness. We're in the first chapter of Mark's gospel when he has just been baptized. We hadn't gotten very far along in Mark at all. And he's just been baptized by John in the River Jordan. And we're told that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, descends upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And then a voice from the heaven says to Jesus, You are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And immediately, we're told, immediately the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. And the actual verb here is the Spirit, the same Spirit that has baptized Jesus derives, that's the word, this same spirit drives Jesus into the desert where he will be tested and tried for 40 days. And I get it. I get the word here, drive, because who in their right mind would go there willingly? Spiritually speaking, the desert is where we battle temptation with a capital T. It's where we face our demons head on. It's where we are confronted with those things that we don't want to see about ourselves, much less acknowledge our blind spots, our unhealed wounds, our shadows, our mistakes, our compulsions, our addictions, and our prejudices. You know, it has been said that before, before the truth can set you free it tends to make you miserable. Let that sink in for a moment. Before the truth can set you free, it tends to make you miserable. Richard Rohr has written a book entitled Falling Upward. And in this book, he calls this dynamic necessary suffering. Rohr explains in his book that we cannot engineer, we cannot plan our own spiritual enlightenment. We can't do that. We have to, most of us, have to stumble and fall so that we will finally get out of the driver's seat for a while. Otherwise, we'll never learn how to let go of control and let God guide us. Which is easier, to be God or to love God? To control people or to love people? To own your life or to love your life? The real temptation for Jesus, the temptation for us as followers and disciples of Jesus is who will lead us? Who will lead us? Will we be led? Will we be led by our own powers? Will we be led by the powers of this world or will we be led by the power of God? Look at all the powers lurking in today's wilderness story. We have the power of Satan. We have the power of those wild beasts. And then Mark saves the best for last. We have the power of the angels. And we're told that while Jesus was in the desert, the angels waited upon him. They cared for him. 
They ministered to Jesus. Now the translation that I think is most apt is the angels served Jesus in that crucible of fire. And then Jesus exits the wilderness. He leaves the desert and he is prepared. He has been made ready to lead. He's been made ready to begin his ministry, his public ministry in Galilee, which will lead to the cross and then to the resurrection. Now looking still in Mark's gospel, I want you to fast forward with me to the 10th chapter. Because at this point in the gospel, Jesus is nearing. He is nearing the end of his ministry. He's with the disciples. And he is about to, in the next chapter, enter into Jerusalem for that last week of his life. And with the disciples, he, he begins to explain to them what is about to happen. How he is going to be betrayed and he's going to be handed over and he's going to be condemned to suffer and to die. And then three days later, he says he will rise again. And two of his disciples, James and John, they ask Jesus for something. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And they say, we want to know if we can sit on your right and on your left when you enter into glory. And Jesus says to them, you do not know what you are asking. And he says to them, can you drink of the cup that I drink from? Can you receive the baptism that I receive? And then he goes on to tell his disciples, it is not his to do. It is not mine to give you this kind of glory. That is not my task, he says. It belongs to those for whom it has been prepared. And then he goes on to say, he compares the Gentile rulers to the disciples. He says, you know, these rulers, the rulers of the world, they show off their power, their authority, and their, their high ranks by bossing everyone around. But you, that's not God's vision for the world. That's not God's vision of authority. And so he says to the disciples, whoever wants to be great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be the slave of all. And then Jesus goes on to describe himself and his own ministry. And he said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The test of true leadership, the test of a true leader is that he or she serves. And I believe that's the lesson that Jesus learns in the wilderness. Or at least this lesson is solidified for him. Because it is the temptation and trial of all time. And the temptation in the wilderness has to do with power. And true power, God's saving power, happens when we human beings relinquish of that power. Letting God be God allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us even into those places we would rather not go. And so this Lenten season, my invitation is this. Let us be led. Let us be led by the Spirit. By that same Spirit that baptized Jesus and drove him into the wilderness. Let us be led by that same spirit that guided his entire ministry all the way up to the cross. Because we are told in the good news of the gospel that the way of the cross, the way of the cross leads to life, life everlasting. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.